Hello, my name is David Adess. I'm a poet based in Sydney and the host of a monthly poetry podcast series called Poets Corner in association with West Words. West Words is Western Sydney's literature development organisation. Poets Corner is part of West Words public programming that celebrates the richness, diversity and insight that literature offers. Especially in these times, we thank the ongoing support of Create New South Wales, the Cultural Fund of Copyright Australia, City of Parramatta Council, Blacktown City Council and Campbelltown City Council, as well as the many project partners that have enabled us to continue to provide opportunities to writers and audiences. We hope that this new world will see a sharing and a closeness of spirit. So each month, I invite a poet to read poems and talk about them on a theme of the poet's choice for about an hour or so. Our guest poet today is Michelle Seminara, and I'll introduce her in a moment. She will read poems and talk on the theme of suburban noir. But before we start, a couple of um, housekeeping notes. Uh, we are in week five of Sydney's latest COVID-19 uh, lockdown. Uh, as you can see, my, my background has changed. I've been booted outside because all the rooms inside are being used by kids. Uh, there is likely to be some background chaos during the course of this recording. Please put up with that um, and we'll see how we go. And before we start, I'd also like to do uh, my usual acknowledgement of country. I'm recording this from Beecroft in Sydney. Michelle is recording from the Northern Beaches, also in Sydney. I would like to pay my respects to and acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of the Wellamita people, the traditional custodians of the land in Beecroft, and also of the Camaragal or Guy Mariagal people, the traditional custodians of the land of the Northern Beaches. And to acknowledge also that they are the sovereign owners of their land, which has never been ceded or given up. Michelle Seminara is a poet and editor from Sydney. Her writing has twice been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and has appeared in journals such as Cordite, Mascara Literary Review, Jacket 2 Magazine and Australian Poetry Journal. She has published two full length collections, Suburban Fantasy, which is just out from UWA Publishing, an engraft published with Island Press in 2016. And the chapbook Scar to Scar, written with Robbie Coburn, Press Press 2016, and Hush, Blank Room Press 2017. Michelle has performed her poetry, chaired panels, and appeared at numerous literary events and festivals across Australia, including Newcastle Writers' Festival, Wollongong Writers' Festival, Queensland Poetry Festival, and, well, supposedly upcoming in August 2021, if if lockdown doesn't prevent it, uh, the Canberra Writers' Festival. She is curator of the Manly Art Gallery and Museum Poetry Alive Readings and managing editor of online creative arts journal, Verity La. Find more about Michelle at her website, which you can access through https colon stroke stroke michelleseminara.net stroke. Hi, Michelle, and welcome to Poets Corner. Hey, David, thank you so much for having me. Uh, very welcome. Um, now you've chosen suburban noir as your theme. I can't, I can't think of a more appropriate theme just at the moment. Week five into lockdown, I'm going a bit stir crazy. <laughs> I'm feeling very suburban noir. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in that. And also in wondering what goes on behind all the doors of all the houses that I, that I walk past in my daily walks when I'm trying to get out of mine. Uh, and in suspecting often a dark underbelly. So much goes on behind closed doors. I can't help but think that this is very fertile territory for a poet to investigate. And this is your beat, isn't it? Uh, yes, this is my beat. Maybe just because I'm very boring. <laughs> but um, I think that's one of the beauties of, um, you know, the theme we're discussing today, suburban noir. What appears on the surface um, to be often quite tranquil and quite ordinary, and actually people make um, a lot of effort to, you know, ensure that appearance. Um, every now and again things erupt and things are erupting all the time behind those closed doors. Sometimes they erupt so violently that they erupt outside the doors and other people are aware as they walk by uh, what's happening. So I suppose um, 
I chose this theme because I find that that very fertile ground. It's it's it is my stomping ground, and um, yeah, my most recent book and probably my last one in graft as well. Really, um, yeah, traverses traverses that territory. So um, I, I'm just wondering about this. The masthead of Verity La, the journal you edit, says, "Be brave." Mm. Um, and I, I, I was just wondering whether in some ways that is kind of like a personal manifesto for you in your own writing. Ah, that's a really interesting question. I inherited that um, masthead from our my former um, uh, Verity La editor, who was um, Nigel Featherston. So he very much, um, he was lovely. He trained me up for a few months before I took the journal. I had no idea what I was doing. And I was being quite brave slash stupid slash naive in taking it on, I think. But sometimes, you know, what you don't know um, gives you a little bit of extra bravery. You know, if you knew, you may not have done it. So um, I inherited Be Brave from him. And actually, that was really great because whenever I came back to him in the first few months when I was sort of training up as the managing editor, if I had a difficult decision to make, whether I had to tell somebody, I had to grow a bit more of a spine, you know, tell somebody something I didn't want to or refuse publication of something for certain reason, whatever it was, Nigel would always say, um, just make the be brave and make the decision that is right for the journal, that is your job, you know. So that was really good training for me. So I think, um, I think... I, although I've inherited that um, that little tagline, it definitely is something that um, being the editor of Verity Lara has helped me to um, bring more into my life, you know, professionally and personally. And, yeah, I, I like the idea of um, bravery as something where, you, you know, you're quite afraid um, for consequences, whether it be for writing and, and putting some stuff out there, which, you know, might shock people, editing or just in your average life. Um, I like the idea of feel the fear and, and do it anyway. So I do tend to live and die by my sword. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, speaking personally, it's hard to be brave. So Yeah, it, it is hard to be brave. It's funny. I, I find it harder not to be brave, though. It's strange because um, sometimes I know that when I'm making certain decisions, I should actually um, probably or more on the side of caution. But if I can't sort of sleep straight in bed at night, if I can't live with my own decision, I find that harder than, um, you know, swallowing things down and just putting up with things the way they are. So I, as much as I find it hard to be brave, I think the only reason that I often push myself to do that is because I find it harder not to be. I find it harder to... <laughs> Um, I'll live on live on my knees, as they say. <laughs> All right. Do you want to start reading a poem for us? Sure. So the first poem I'm going to read is called North Facing. It is the first um, poem in my new collection, Suburban Fantasy. And actually, um, it's it's a sort of a, an opening poem, a way of entering the book. Um, and yeah, I think it is it is quite a revealing and brave um, poem. And as I say, an invitation to step into the quite dark underbelly of suburbia, North Facing. This house has too many windows. Anyone can see in. It's one of those houses people stroll through the back door. They feel free. This house was not chosen by me, but by my husband and father, who pronounced it to be a fine, solid, master-built house, built by masters who morph into monsters. It opens benignly to the morning sun, turning in the right direction. I'm told I should be grateful I am not, which makes me. This house has two stories, two stories. The downstairs unrolling like a fiery tongue. I was always afraid to be pushed down. But now that the opening is closing, touch wood, I've begun to write over the holy holy punched in the door of hell. They say suffering is good for you. I can't tell. This is not my home. I don't live here. I abide in the safe house my mind has constructed from word wood. Only I can enter the back door. Others must knock. If I choose not to be home, I'm not. But here, my face faces painfully outwards, overexposing its north lit bits. Here, there is only one room to hide in, one secret space in which to sit, and this, this gash of a poem, this is it. 
Period um, beginning. <laughs> period beginning. I'm sorry. I there was a bit of background noise at this end. There was a train going past, and ah. I mute myself. And we, and we also have a tinkling of some wind chimes. Um, yeah. Now this this poem is full of foreboding. So mm. it's a it's a it's a kind of scary way to enter a book, really. First up, it demarcates a schism between house and home, doesn't it? Um, the house as you say, opens benignly to the morning sun, but there is nothing benign about the house for the narrator, is there? Mm -hmm. You're quite right. You know, this poem, um, I, I put it in the beginning, I was kind of inspired by um, a, a book I love is Satan's Dance by Sharon Olds. It was her first, you know, first book, I think. And it opens with an incredible poem. I can't remember what it's called now, but it's it's a box opening. And um, there's there's a um, very tortured sort of female presence inside that box. And it in, invites you into the Pandora's box that the, the, the poet's collection is opening, you know, and it's full of very dark suburban noir. So I was a little bit inspired by that to place place this poem first. Um, yeah, hopefully people people read on and don't get too scared. <laughs> well, the, the narrator is not at home in her house. She's trapped. She's a prisoner, in effect, deprived of choice and autonomy and has to seek refuge in a secret room in her mind. Does this, does this poem come from lived experience or from knowledge of lived experience? Or have you just imagined the narrator in this scenario? say all three David you know obviously the impetus well for me anyway the impetus of a poem always comes from some sort of lived experience or just emotion you know emotional spark there's got to be an intensity there something you're driven to express of course after that you know it is an artistic construction so you have to um, then you know bring in as you say other people's experience knowledge of other people's lived experience and um, a huge part of this book is talking about female autonomy um, and uh, liberation in the sense of freedom, not just externally, um, but internally. So I think all three, um, uh, when this book came out, actually my mum came around and she and she got a copy of the book and I said, mum, just don't ask me if I'm okay after you read it. I'm okay. <laughs> so nobody asked me if I'm okay, I'm fine. All the darkness goes into the poems. But I think sometimes when people read poetry, they always assume that every poem is, you know, some sort of autobiographical nugget from the, the narrator and to some sense that's true to some extent I think um, that there is that emotional spark that that must ignite the poem but I think after that all bets are off so um, yes I would say all three. Well that's why I referred to the, the, the narrator. Oh no you're very tactful. <laughs> um, now I just noticed at the very end the secret space that she hides in is this gash of a poem mm. and it almost suggests to me that the narrator is bleeding into the poem, if you like, oh. and and uh, that the poem is, or poetry and the poem is refuge, if not salvation. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, very much so. You know, that's very much how I came to poetry. I've always written, but I've only been writing poetry for about, probably about seven years now, actually. And one of the reasons I really, uh, I've always loved reading poetry, but I didn't think I was, you know, much good at it. But I began writing poetry at a time when, um, you know, I was, our family was going through quite a difficult time. And also I was so, so busy. You know, my children were much smaller than I had three smaller children. And I literally, I, I really felt drawn and driven to write but I didn't have time I didn't have free hands um, so poetry became a real refuge in the sense that it's something I could tinker with in my head as I changed nappies and hung out washing and so forth and then later on when I did have time I could sit down and write so it yeah for me it was very and, and continues to be very much a refuge I think that's one of the greatest gifts that poetry um, gives us as a society as well you know people who don't even normally read poetry we always turn to it when it comes to the big stuff in life you know it's got a particular way of resonating um resonating with um the the big stuff that we all go through as people and and it, i think the refuge that it gives in that sense um is not just a release for the writer but a sense of community or um commune between reader and writer you're not alone you know everyone's experiencing this sort of um uh, intensity at certain times in their life and i think that's the ultimate refuge refuge probably um the poem itself um provides that for both reader and writer yeah well we we write in order to connect mm. I, hope, I hope we do 
uh, mostly. Uh, what's your next poem? Ooh, let's have a look. Surprise, surprise bag. Ah, another cheery one. <laughs> it's called Blood Nature. So this poem is, um, it's not an ecrastic poem as such, but it is inspired by Edvard Munch's very famous painting, The Scream, which um, he actually did um, about four different variations of that, um, of that particular picture in different, sort of using different, um, different um, painterly, you know, styles. Um, but um, so it's called uh, The Scream of Nature. And in one of these particular um, variations of that uh, picture, he he wrote a poem around the frame of the, of the picture. So I found that really inspiring. I'll just quickly read that. Um, so Blood Nature is an ecrastic poem after Edvard Munch's painting The Scream of Nature, passed along board 1895, around the wooden frame of which is painted. I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun was getting, setting. The sky turned a blood red and I felt a whiff of melancholy. I stood still, deathly tired, over the blue-black fjord and city hung blood and tongues of fire. My friends and I walked on. I remained behind, shivering with anxiety. I felt the great scream in nature. I find that really chilling, more chilling than the, the famous picture, you know, there. <laughs> so um, that's probably this poem is more inspired by that little poem that he wrote around the edge of his frame than the actual, the actual picture. But I'll get on and read it, Blood Nature. The scream punctured my sleep, existential and unruly, an epicenter of anxiety raiding out to irradiate the world. The neighbours stopped talking to us when they heard it. My own mother stopped answering her phone. No one knew what to expect or when. The scream dictated our heartbeats. They fled like gods. From the bottom of the house it rose, a siren of red up into our beds, possessing my mouth, the mouths of our children, bruised blue black from swallowing it down. We all walked around with our gobs ghastly wide hands cradling dislodged minds. Nature rebelled in familial blood and we in disorder obeyed her. I tried to smother it with love, hate, scotch, meds, pillows, but the scream pervaded everywhere. It spoke with tongues of fire. I cut it free. Um, you've taken Edward Edvard Munch's painting and transplanted it into a domestic setting. Mm. Um, I would never have thought to do that uh, because uh, I, I'm familiar with the, the painting and I've always seen it as an outdoor, I mean, it is a scream of nature, um, an outdoor setting painting. What made you think of transplanting it into a, a domestic environment? Mm. I just think that the reason that painting is so incredibly popular is it really speaks to sort of an existential state which most people at some point in their lives, um, you know, meet for various reasons, you know, sometimes through um, struggles with mental health, you know, sometimes through external circumstances that are thrust upon us that we feel too overwhelmed by to be able to, um, to cope with. Um, there's all sorts of um, ways we can get to that state, hit that sort of uh, existential rock bottom and I think that um, you know this this happens in suburbia this is part of maybe the essence of suburban noir this because this is where normal life happens you know when we go out the door and we go about we're in a, um, a kind of a not a made up life but a different a different um, iteration of ourselves so to speak and um, you know we are all I think communally uh, creating a reality where everything's okay you know uh, at least for some time but when you're at home and you, you're with your family as we know we all you know we get real and so I really think actually suburbia is the perfect um, the perfect setting for this kind of um, feeling because this this is where it happens you know late at night uh, in your jammies, perhaps you've drunk too much or, you know, the family's going nuts or whatever's, you know, your partner's left you or that's, that's, where, that's where it gets real. Um, yeah, so that's why it took place at a domestic city. <laughs> well, there is, of course, something primal about screaming. Um, we have all screamed mm. and we have all held scream, screams within us. So, so this is an experience we all share. Um, but we don't talk about it. Um, 
And there's often, to me, it seems a curious silence around screams as though the very act of screaming muffles all the voices around the screams. Mm. Is, is that something you were trying to elucidate in this poem? Mm. Oh, that's so interesting, yeah. I think, um, I think in this poem what I was really trying to um, express was the um, the catchy or um, not catchy as in sense of, you know, um, like a catchy jingle, but in terms of the way something jumps from one person to another, you know, the anxiety uh, in one person, especially when you're close to people, you know. So, for example, um, if you have someone in your in your family or close friendship group, but I think particularly family, you know, who's going through something really tough, it's not just their problem, it's your problem. It's not just their scream, it's your scream. And I was trying to... Um, um, yeah, sort of elucidate the panic and the anxiety that jumps from one person to another. Um, it's like a virus in a sense, and it's very hard to keep your center and not not be swept up in that. So, um, yeah, the scream, you're right, it does. It silences everything else. It pushes everything else to the edges for a moment um, and becomes the most dominant and controlling emotion and, and thing in the room. And, yeah, so I suppose to some extent I was expressing that. Yeah, how, how how do you cut it free? Ah, that's a good question, David. <laughs> I think that throughout um, throughout this book, Suburban Fantasy, there's a there's a lot about being a mother in this book, um, and we all know that being well, not everyone, but you know, we're all being at least children, and we have you know parents. Um, many people are parents, uh, but particularly when you are parents, it's really interesting as your children go. You know, there's there's a sense where you have to let go, and um, you have to um, let your children, you know, make up their own decisions, and even if even if that's something that you don't approve of or you think will you know bring them some harm you have to it, I think that's one of the hardest parts of parenting when children are very little it's very difficult because you're very hands-on and you hardly have time to you know scratch but um, you can to some extent control their world and um, make things better as your children go this is no longer in your in your power and that's actually a really difficult thing um, as a mom I've found that the the letting free or the cutting free you know and sometimes it is a cutting free because you sometimes have to have boundaries up to also protect yourself you know in certain situations and and not step in and solve other people's problems so I think um, that's what the cutting free refers to the difficult stance where you as much as you may love somebody um, you don't have the power necessarily to set things right and as a mum that's a really hard hard truth to come to terms with I'm sorry there's a bit more background noise here a bit, mm -hmm. a bit of external noise um, yeah, I find that tricky because it seems to me that the scream almost takes residence mm. and that it becomes uh, a reflex, a pattern of behavior that, you know, happens before you can stop it from happening. Um, so I, 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 I mean, I'd love to cut it free, but I, I don't think it's that easy to do. It's not, it's not easy to do. It's not always an option. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. What's next? Okay. Okay. Next we have family tree. So moving into more of suburban noir family tree, they cut the limbs off first of that tree, which is me, the one which bears the blaring yellow X on its chest. The arborist eye could see it had been wounded long ago. Then disease entered the hole at its heart, then necrosis, gliding through the vessels in a cool grey onslaught, weakening the branches we once festooned for Christmas and Halloween. Nobody noticed for a long time, especially I didn't notice. Not until the last leaf slipped to the pavement did I look up. They amputate the limbs to make it easier to fell. I know that feeling. Now all through the house, the stench of diesel and that terrible enraged squealing. Mm. So like many of your poems and the ones you certainly the ones you're going to read today, this poem has a very direct gaze. You want to look things in their eye and name them, don't you? Yes, I'm, I'm definitely a better out than in person and I'm a let's look at it and see what, what it's for and, and deal with it sort of person. I actually find that 
um, that that's helpful. I find it, I'd rather know what I'm dealing with and, and look them in the eye. And I, I'm not scared of darkness. I, I don't mind exploring that world. I think, um, I think it's interesting, actually. I think it's interesting. It's not that it's not scary, but it's um, really the darkness is the darkness of our own mind. That's what we're looking into. So um, I'm a Buddhist, so we're very into sitting with our darkness. <laughs> uh, I do see a little bit of Buddhism just behind you there. Um, your poems are often about articulating and facing damage. In this case, the damage within a family. And I, I guess you've sort of partly answered um, this question, but I'll ask it anyway. Is this for you something like exorcism, that, that by facing the damage, you can somehow vanquish it? Or is it something less ambitious, like simply confronting your own fears by shining light upon areas of dark? Mm. Yeah, I don't think there's a sense of vanquishing. I'm a bit too old in the tooth, long in the tooth now to, <laughs> to think I can vanquish um, darkness. Um, no, I think it's just about being, being okay with it, you know, looking it in the eye. I think that things are scary when they're not looked at and that when we look at things, particularly things within ourselves, um, then, then that's when they lose their power over us. They certainly don't disappear um, or go away necessarily, um, but you can transform them to some extent. Um, and even just by gazing at them, shining a light, that's the first step, I think, in, in moving towards becoming friends with that darkness and figuring out how to mentally um, work with it and, and cope with it. Mm. All right. Uh, next poem. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so the next poem is called Plot, and it's a remix poem. So for those who don't know, um, a remix poem is um, a sort of a broad umbrella term that refers to a poem that takes any other text and sort of messes around with it to create something new. So there's some poems that are, say, erasure poems, where you take a, you know, a paragraph or page of text and you black out words, you have to keep the original words in their place and somehow make a sort of a, a poem out of what's left by very strategically choosing you know words um, or you can just take someone else's work and if it resonates with you remix it by using words sometimes phrases but it's a bit cheaty to use you know too many you want to really make it your own um, your own work and I often do this with works that really resonate with me and I, I see something in there that I can draw out and um, yeah draw out a thread in that poem that offers another view so this poem plot is remixed from Philip Larkin's very famous poem called The Wits and Wedding and I think most people are aware of this poem. Often we have to study it in school. So, you know, the, the speaker sitting on a train and he's going down to London and as he goes through the stops, you know, there's um, it's a it's a Sunday. Is it a Sunday or a, which day is Whitson? Maybe it's a Wednesday. I don't know. But anyway, it's the marriage day. So there's a whole lot of um, happy couples getting on and off the train and people waving them goodbye and so forth. And so the narrator starts to sort of, you know, think and ponder on this idea of, of marriage and and our aspirations and where they take it. But he does this very much through a male lens. And so I was thinking about the reality for women, say, in the time he was writing, like into the 1950s, um, what was the reality of women's lives um, then? What were their choices? You know, um, they weren't as open as his possibly. Um, so that got me going on a bit of a feminist ranty tanty um, and so I wrote this um, re remixed version of um, Wits and Weddings called Plot. All afternoon the women shared their wounding, loosed from fathers, free of knots, under their belts, the secret smut, a hothouse lark, the race to wed, time gripping tighter. Along the line children defined the marked off landscape of their lives, Marriage struck, then swelled, then slowed, the girl displaced inside. A blinding sense of nondescript, bright parodies of dull success, their aims like arrows falling out of sight as if they'd died. And not one flashed uniquely and nothing fresh survived. Yes, uh, nothing fresh survived. Um... I've always thought that sharing wounding is a good thing, you know, that if you share a wound, you can come to a better understanding of the wound and, and find support that might lead you um, towards some form of healing. Mm -hmm. Is this poem turning that notion on its head and suggesting that it is all a waste of time? 
Well, it is It is quite a, a cynical poem, isn't it? I suppose not so much. I mean, I think that probably the, the, the positive note, the one positive note in the poem is probably the woman sharing their wounding. But I think what that really alludes to is that, especially in, say, 1950s suburbia, much more so than in, you know, 2020 suburbia, a woman's options, um, her ability to really be frank about um, the realities of her life and, and the actual realities of her life, um, you know, as a, as a young person expected to get married, have multiple babies, quite quickly, not be able to own property, not be able to necessarily get a great job and so forth. Um, this means that there's a whole secret life of women going on underneath um, underneath Larkin's gaze, certainly in this poem, you know, um, which he didn't write about in the poem. Um, so that's why I thought I would unearth some of that, using his own words to um, to create a sort of a alternative reality um, to, to the one that he was um, holding up in the poem. So I think women sharing their wounding is it's um, it's a positive, you know, and that's that's where women get a lot of their strength from, particularly I think in times when you weren't. Uh, it wasn't okay to talk about, you know, talk about the realities of life. So, yeah, I think the the wounding is a, is a positive thing, um, and I think, yeah, that that's where we do find refuge in sharing our wounding. That that's a great that's a great um, sort of summing up of, of poetry. I think. Well, women have always done this, I think, and in, in, in across every culture, um, and it's something that men are only really beginning to tap into and start to sort of get some sort of solidarity amongst themselves as well. Um, for men, sharing wounding is, is not a natural thing. Um, maybe we need to learn from you. Uh, but uh, it'd be interesting. I'd, I'd really like to know what Philip Larkin would think of this remix. It'd be quite scathing, so I'm not sure I'd like to know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's your next poem, Michelle? Okay, so next up we have um, another one where, you know, turning the idea of, um, exploring the idea of motherhood. And this, you know, when you first have a child, um, you know, I can only talk from the experience of a mother. Um, there's, it's very much a sort of um, metamorphosis of yourself as a human being. Um, so before you have the child, you're, you're seen as a, and you think of yourself as a singular you know, creature, um, and then you become this thing called a mother. And so there's a real transformation um, of yourself and you have to go through um, a real psychological shift, which I don't think is something that people really talk about very much. I think we all talk a lot about the physical changes, you know, your body will go through. But no one, well, when I had my first child, you know, ever really prepared me for the mental the mental changes and I remember being just absolutely shocked of course having your first baby is a huge shock for many reasons but I remember just um, a couple of weeks after my first child was born just I dropped her off with my mom uh, for a couple of hours and I just went into I have a lovely patch of um, bush manly dam where I, I, we had a house a family house right next to there so that was my backyard it was just roamed through there you know as a kid and that was my my happy refuge so I just remember dropping my little girl off with my um, walking into the bush and just sitting on a rock and just going oh my god <laughs> my life is over like what have I done you know and it wasn't that I didn't love my daughter to death and back it, actually that was part of the problem because I just realized there was a little part of my heart now walking around and she's going to grow up and walk around outside of me I would have no control over what happened to her and whatever happened to her would happen to me if something if she's not happy I'm not happy and so forth so this sense of complete like changing this concept of yourself yourself doesn't end here it stands out you know um and and it just makes you feel very vulnerable um and I felt you know quite scared and it took me a little while to come to terms with all that and then by the time you had the second and third child it's like oh, yeah you know it's fine but um I think that this revolutionary concept of yourself going from a single woman to mother is quite you know quite a quite a big thing and then then what happens is there's a whole lot of societal expectations that you kind of absorb you know so you know there's a lot of guilt around mothering and mothers are naturally guilty sort of feeling creatures I think but there's that whole sense of um you know wanting to be really good mother whatever that is and doing everything right and 
for first time mums particularly, they internalize and feel a lot of that pressure, you know. And so this poem, I wanted to explore what 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 mothers as uh, full human beings, you know, what's really going on under that facade? Because in a sense, you are playing a role when you're playing mother and you're playing it out of love and for a very good reason, because it's what your children, your children need. But um, yeah, that's similar sense to what you were saying, David, as you're walking through the neighbourhood and looking in at other people's windows and wondering what's going on in there. This poem refers to a similar, similar thing. So other mothers. I wonder if all the other mothers' faces pinch too. Do they eye the time to sip respite? Break out at night to stare longingly in. Shock dumb limbs to life, embracing waters. I wonder if they feed on their children, feed their children, if their masks itch and slip in heat, contract in cold, contain the urge, the surge of migratory flight. If years petrify around their sights, the panic of darting eyes, if underneath their aims are warped like wings. Well, it's such a big subject, isn't it, motherhood? I mean, parenting generally, I, I find as a father, that I am confronting failure all the time. And I don't much like it, but you know, you just have to deal with the fact that every day you fail your kids in one way or another. And, and that's part of the part of the experience. Um, there is a continuous conflict felt by, I think all parents really, but particularly by mothers, um, because they are locked into a role that requires them to give endlessly of themselves and some of them are more suited to, to that than others um, with, no, with no real prospect of escape. Um, not surprisingly, there are times when they can't give more of themselves or where they do so grudgingly or where they resist the demands on them or where they, they seek to escape, all of those things. And all the while, there's this acute, I think, heightened consciousness of how all the mothers around them are navigating the same territory. I'm sure that this is, you know, the sort of territory that the poem's alluding to. Um, there is a, is a kind of competitiveness uh, between mothers too, isn't there? Mm. Yeah, it's such a it's such a fraught um, sort of territory. You know, it's so full of contradictory emotions, and I think um, that's that's probably probably you know motherhood might be at the very um at the very base or heart of suburban noir you know or especially in, in my particular um case because um it's it's um yeah there's a lot of complex and really intense emotions that go on with parenting and um yeah you're right there is a sense of competitiveness sometimes I think as I think as you sink into your role as mother it's much less so um I think when you're a new mum it's uh, much more so because you do initially internalize those um those those ideas that you might have to be this great mum so you walk around with this mask on quite you know and then that I think that when you're wearing a mask and you don't feel comfortable that's when you actually become more competitive and more you know or jealous or whatever of other people you think oh well that they look fine so they must be having a fabulous time you know but I quite like to look um, to rip the mask off and, and and have a good look. You know, I remember after when I had my first child. You know, I was only quite young, and um, I went. They put you into mother's group. You know, so that oh, you leave the hospital and they suggest you go to this group. But you know, one one session a week for twelve weeks, and I went for a couple of weeks. But my my first um, child was quite. You know, she was really a big crier. Basically, she hardly slept, and she sort of screamed most of the time and I was after a few weeks I was just like this frazzled mess you know this this whole sense of being this Buddhist Zen mom just went straight out the window and I remember we I went to the mother's group hoping you know for some sharing of women's wounding and um everyone sat there and and the lady went around asking everybody you know what their experience was right now and everyone was like oh it's lovely and then, and I'm like okay either I'm the worst mother in the world or they're all lying because you know this is 
really, it cannot be true. You know, I'm not saying everyone has the same experience, but it's still a difficult experience no matter what. So I think in this poem I'm trying to get at that sense of, like, what's really going on um, below, below that mask. And, you know, that it's okay to say that and it doesn't mean you don't love your children to the ends of the earth and back. It just means you're a human being. I know that when we took our first child home, we looked at one another and we said, well, what do we do now? And she was like, you've got a, the panic of darting eyes. There is some panic involved, isn't there? And, it, and, it, and it, I mean, it does settle down, but there are moments of panic all the time, I think. It doesn't altogether disappear. Um, yeah. You write here, I wonder if they feed on their children, feed their children. Um, but I was wondering the opposite, if their children feed on their mothers I mean mm. really that's what goes on isn't it yeah you're right actually that is what goes on I'm not quite sure why I put that line in I like the line um I I think it's like it's a very dark it's a very dark image obviously and mm. it kind of popped out of my subconscious so I left it in there but you're right it probably is more a, a feeling of being fed on sometimes yeah, mm. yeah. yeah rich territory indeed to to investigate mm -hmm. um now, your next poem, I can't pronounce, so you, you, you can start by <laughs> telling me how to pronounce give it, it. Give it a, I'll give it a whirl. I can't pronounce it properly either. So it's a Swedish, um, the title is a Swedish word, and it's given its syndrome, which is obviously probably not very correct. But um, basically the term refers to a psychological condition that I think it was first, it's a Swedish word because it was first um, picked up by psychologists um, uh, to describe a condition that refugee children in Sweden were suffering from. So it basically is called sleeping syndrome. So um, later on, um, children in Nauru in Australia and who've been in long-term detention also started to exhibit this um, same condition. And it's basically a psychological um, response to just extreme trauma and they kind of go into a shutdown state and they um they stop eating they stop drinking they fall into a, a sort of a, it's not it's not quite a coma but it's, it's literally that um similar so yeah that's what this um poem refers to and it begins by uh, with an epigraph from um, novelist dm thomas the unconscious is a precise and even pedantic symbolist all over the camps, children's eyes revolve inwards like moons. Their muscles wane as minds release cruel world. They scored their grief with razors. They lit their flesh like flares, but now their legs lie still as metaphor for resignation. Behind fences, limbs grow thin enough to slip through loopholes, force feeding tubes tether life to life. Judges sanction portals, mothers' bodies flail glass, porous eyelids gauge time to retire. First thirst, then speech, then sight, then sense expire. Beneath the ice, you wend the blank pathways of your mind, your body crossing borders liquefied, withdrawn so far, so far, so far inside. What interim world are you hiding in? In dreams, I hear you calling with the voice of my own child. I keep turning vacant corners looking for liminal beings, lost little ones, my loves. Um, how did you come across this syndrome? Uh, I think it was just reading um, some, you know, I'm quite interested in immigration policy in Australia um, and, you know, terrible way we treat refugees and asylum seekers. And so I read quite a bit of news about it. And, yeah, I think I just read a newspaper article and it was when they were first starting to report uh, on the fact that children on Nauru um, were experiencing this syndrome and there was a lot of um, resistance from the government, even at this stage, you know, to bring them to, um, you know, to onshore Australia for treatment. And a lot of um, lawyers had to work, you know, pro bono. And I think they went to the um, High Court um, to, um, to argue, you know, for extraordinary sort of, you know, conditions and to make an exception and to um, overrule the government and force um, the government to bring the children, um, bring the children to Australia for treatment. There is some suggestion from what I've read that this syndrome isn't really real. It's, it's contentious that, 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 that not everyone um, believes that this syndrome exists. Um, but it makes sense to me in a way. 
that that children who've suffered trauma will respond in, in this way. Um, and it seems to be anecdotally reflected in, you know, stories of say children from Gaza or children from other parts of the world that have been exposed to terrible trauma. Um, and I, I was interested that you sort of mentioned the refugees because I know of your work with, with the asylum seekers and particularly with the, the writers amongst them and your passionate advocacy for them. Um, to what extent were they in your mind when you wrote this poem? Yeah, very, very much so. You know, I think especially as a parent, when you, I mean, you know, whether someone's an adult or a child, you know, holding them in indefinite, uh, indefinite detention for, um, you know, in terrible conditions is, is cruel and traumatic and, and damaging. But it's particularly damaging for children because their brains are developing and you're basically setting them up for a lifetime of, of having, you know, psychological problems because it, it affects them, you know, neurologically. And just as a mum as well I was you know when you see children suffering you think well hang on that could be my child and as a mum how would I or a dad you know how would I how would I cope it's the powerlessness you know I think that's one of the worst things we always want to do something to help and if you're a parent in this situation your child's simply slipping away um, you have no power you know um, and it must be the most horrible feeling to, to be drowning yourself and not be able to save your child also from drowning. Have you had any personal encounters with the state of mind that this poem reflects? I think I have, yeah. I think that when you are actually under a lot of like uh, continual extreme stress, a certain thing happens in your mind where you do tend to shut down mentally, you know, not necessarily to the extent where you're doing so um, physically and, and not responding or eating or drinking, but... I think that when we sometimes feel overwhelmed and powerless to um, change our situation or get away from, you know, something that's long term um, and very traumatic, I think that mind does have a um, way of going into a shutdown and you become a little bit of a blank slate and you start to just walk through life. So I have, yeah, I have experienced, um, you know, I think that's one of the, the dark corners of our mind that we do go to under prolonged extreme stress. Mm -hmm. um, the poem ends with the narrator connecting the children in the poem with her own child. Mm. Um, how personal is this poem for you? Well, I think it is quite personal because I do, you know, I do have quite a few friends in detention. So it's not just a matter of reading, you know, in a newspaper and um, thinking, oh, well, that's, you know, that's that's sad that these people um, are being treated like this. When you, when you actually, you know, um, yeah, you befriend somebody and you know them as a real person and you see. Um, the stupidity of this whole system of just holding people for no, you know, to no one's gain. It costs huge amounts of money to hold people in detention. It harms them. It doesn't help society. It's just, it's just a lose lose. And so I think that when you have personal experience of, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, I used to edit some poets um, who are in detention and so forth, and their poems are just heartbreaking. You know, talk about um, suburban noir, that really pales in comparison to this other level of suffering. Mm. Mm. Um, you've got another two poems for us. I do. Getting cheerier, heading into death now, David. <laughs> So this poem is called uh, Finis and it starts with an epigraph um, uh, from The Imitation of Christ by Thomas de Kempis. Remember always your end and that lost time does not return. For months you watched perplexed, perhaps wondering why we walked and played less or why I wept and drank more. Then there were those dark soul nights spent baying in the back garden at the stars, the flawed organ in your vaulted chest somehow pumping powerfully enough to sustain us. But as you ebbed, I failed to notice your stiff gait, your listlessness, the insidious cough as your lungs began to fill with a foamy tide. And by the time I found time to seek help, you were too far gone, your heart swamped with human grief unfathomable, even to you? Well, there's a lot of things that resonate uh, for me in this poem. Um, 
it brings to mind the the Latin expression "carpe diem," seize the day. Mm. Um, it's hard at the best of times, especially hard in lockdown, not to be acutely conscious of how we spend our time and of what might be perceived as lost time. Um, how to live life without, you know, frittering away time. Um, I know that it was probably written a while ago, but is this in any way a lockdown poem? Yes, you picked it. <laughs> it is from the, the first lockdown we went through around June, July 2020. So, yes, it was a lockdown poem, pretty much the only one I wrote, you know. Um, I And it also one of the reasons I wrote this poem is to do, we had a beautiful Labrador called Ace and he died at that time. He was only quite young. He was only six, but he had, um, like we found out he had a, a sort of congenital heart condition. So from being a very fit, you know, fit dog who just, I thought he just had a little cough and we took him to the vet. Next thing they say, oh, he's only got a few months to live. And then it was, you know, we just tried to keep him happy and comfortable um, while he died. And so there was a whole lot of stuff going on around this time, um, you know, COVID, other personal stuff and then you learn your, your dog's dying and then it's just like oh dear okay so um what I what I was uh what I learned from from my beautiful dog and I think dogs do teach us a hell of a lot was not to not to waste time because I was I was really um spending a lot of time worrying and thinking about things um and then I found out that he was um you know he would be dead soon and I thought no okay that's it now I'm not worrying with this stupidity of human stuff because it never ends does it all the dramas we go through and the ups and downs and you know people's opinions and judgments and so forth um I thought no I'm switching off from all that um it's not going to end unless I end it and so I decided to just um just be present with my my dog we took him to lots of places last hurrah here last hurrah there he used to love it when he had a birthday we're a pathetic family we'd, you know make him a little doggy birthday cake and sing happy birthday so I just decided every day was happy birthday until he died so every day he'd have a little cake with a candle in and we just gave him as much fun as we could until he was too sick to really appreciate it um anymore and he just needed it, you know just comfort but that was a real turning point for me I thought um that we you know lost time does not return you must remember your end and that's a really big Buddhist um teaching as well you know there's a Buddhist um, meditation where you're encouraged to sit um, and contemplate your own death you know visualize your body visualize your funeral or visualize a clock ticking and realizing that every second you're getting closer to death and the idea isn't to depress yourself the idea is to realize okay this the time is limited you really have no no um, knowledge of when it will end and um, what what do you want to do in this moment given that because if you if you forget that then you can waste your precious moments on a whole lot of stupidity so um um, and, and the world really encourages you to do so. So, um, yeah, that's that's where this poem is coming from. It's so one thing to know that. It's another thing to live it, though, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's very much so. You know, I think that um, I'm pretty good at living it, I think, by day. At night, I tend to, um, is when I tend to worry about worldly things, you know. Um, sleep, especially in this period, didn't come easy. And so I would think I was, I had it sorted. I was doing okay. <laughs> and then I'd try and sleep in the 3 a.m. wake-ups, <gasps> you know, and just yeah, your brain gets up to all sorts, you know. And so um, a friend gave me some great advice, which was, you know, I was like, how am I going to deal with this, this great sense of, like, anxiety that's pushing up in me? I felt a great sense of shame as well at that time. It was a really difficult time. And um, and she said, well, she said, just go towards it. Just, just sink into it. Like, how, let's just sit there. How bad does it feel? Okay, so this has happened, that's happened. Now what? And so I found that really, really helpful. So if I woke up in the middle of the night, I'd just do that these meditations like come on bring it on you know let's see and you find that you're fine these emotions they come they go you're still standing and it's not it's not easy to do and it is a continual process so but it's one worth doing yeah look one lesson i learned it took me a long time to learn it is that we spend an inordinate amount of our time worrying about things that we can't control and uh if we just focus on the things we can control we're a lot better off for doing for doing that it's easier said than done but yeah, um, yeah. i did notice in this poem um 
I failed to notice. Mm. Um, that's a very strong thing for me because I think that uh, noticing is really important mm. and we can go through life failing to notice really important things that are going on around us. Um, yeah. To what extent is that the message you're trying to impart to? Yeah, that's definitely um, part of um, a big part of this poem. It's also about guilt, you know. I felt guilty. I felt like my dog was, I know this sounds strange, I'm not saying it's logical, but, you know, this is how minds think. I felt like my dog would, um my dog was, you know, he was trained as a guide dog. Uh, he was a failed guide dog, so he was too boisterous. So we got him and he's lovely. But he, he was very much, he, he, I was his person. He would sit there, you know, we did a lot of fun stuff. And as I was going through a difficult period last year, he just would sit next to me all day and just look at me with this worried look in his eye. It was like, what's happened to mom? Like, you know, she used to be quite happy and now she's always, you know, crying and drinking and wailing, you know. So, um I felt this strong sense of guilt as if my dog were absorbing uh, my negativity um, and I didn't realise and it was swamping his lungs. I know it's a metaphor, but it also felt, you know, mothers, as I say, we're always guilty, <laughs> So uh, even for, for mothers. So I just, um, yeah, that, that was a huge part of it. I felt like, oh, if I'd noticed, I could have I done something. But I think that is, um, you can broaden that out, as you say, um, we don't notice a lot of things because we allow our attention to be diverted um, from often what's just a lot of crap and will never end, you know. So, um, yeah, failing to notice is something we all suffer from. And I think it's a continual discipline of bringing your attention away, especially from things like social media, um, just the busyness so that now we have a 24-7 news. It's so hard to um, focus on the small important things, the interactions between your loved ones, your own internal world, um and you know it's it's a discipline that you have to um you have to practice yeah look i find it's harder and harder to be present everyone's kind of like in the past or in the future but you got to be in the now yeah yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, you know, it doesn't come easy. I think that we have to really, you know, it's a very Buddhist saying, guard your minds, you know, but it's true. You have to, you have to guard your mind. Um, what you let into it is what you eventually uh, become. So it's, um, you know, you are what you eat mentally as well as physically, I think. And you have one more poem for us. I do. So this one is the last poem in um, Suburban Fantasy and it's called Incarnate. So it's a poem I wrote um, uh, in memoriam Ramon Leola. So I know, David, you knew beautiful Ramon. He was a poet from Sydney and he was such a beautiful, beautiful soul, really. I just... Um, I can't stress that enough. I know everyone says that once somebody's passed away, but everyone said it when, when, when Ramon was here as well. He was just so gorgeous, too gorgeous for the world, really. So um, he passed away, you know, I think he was only 51, 52, way too, way too young and quite suddenly. So when he did... Um, uh, his family uh, were, you know, sorting out his um, things and they wanted to give his books away. So um, one of Ramon's friends, Andy, very kindly took Ramon's quite extensive library into his own home um, because Ramon was a really great supporter of everybody else in the poetry world. He would go to every, you know, every launch and opening and buy everyone's book. You know, he was so lovely. So he had this vast library, especially around poetry. And so Andy took the um, poems in to his own house and then he invited his friends you know come come over and pick what you would like as a sort of um you know um in memory of Ramon so I did and one of the books I picked up was a book called Four Reincarnations by Max Ritvo and Max was a young I think um American poet and so he died quite suddenly not as suddenly as Ramon but early you know he was in his 20s I think he died of cancer and his book Four Reincarnations a beautiful book um all around you know the death process and 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 renewal as well and reincarnation so this was one of the books I picked up from Ramon's library and uh, when I when I did pick it up it just really struck me about the way um, you know this sense of cycling around you know so Ramon introduced me to Max Ritvo uh, I read his book it was about death um, I was still thinking a lot about Ramon and his passing and I was thinking about what we leave behind us and um, how we others live through us and and through through their words as well 
so um, incarnate in memoriam Ramon Leola. I'm reading for reincarnations by Max Ritvo, the book An Unintentional Bequest by my friend, the poet Ramon Leola. Unlike Max, Ramon was evicted by his body from life suddenly, unexpectedly. He left like you leave your home every morning, intending to return. Stepping out, his soul shed all but what barely exists, leaving behind just those earthy accruements which others might find useful. A, low, a library illuminated with notes and creased corners, his own poems lodged like touchstones in our minds, the sacred relics of his recyclable organs, all circling out there in the world of others, a generosity of thought and flesh reverberating through space-time. A papery vein burst in Ramon's brain and out tumbled his full bounty of jewels, each orb a revelation of pomegranate seed quickening on our tongues. We come as supplicants, scavengers, curators to feast on his cryptic freeze. And now, within the fragile bubble of my own body mind, as I divine Max Ritbo via Ramon Leola, I glimpse both poets coil like silver koi linked head to tail in the glistening chain mail of my poem. Yes, I, I do remember Ramon, of course. Um, he was taken from us too soon and it was pretty shocking at the time. In Poets' Corner last month, um, Anthony Lawrence suggested that every poem is an elegy of some kind. Uh, and of course, this is an elegy to Ramon. Um, in remembering someone, we try to preserve their memory so that they remain with us at least in some form. And you do that, of course, in the poem. But you also forge a link that speaks of a greater continuity. When you link Ramon with Max, and then with yourself. What is the significance of that linkage, linkage for you? I think the significance of that linkage is um, a sense of um, being part of a lineage of poets and not necessarily poets, but just people who um, have, um, you know, who have worked to, to understand life and to express it in some creative way and who pass down their own experience and their wisdom and knowledge and, um, you know, that we, that we can learn from. And it's a sense of not being alone. You're not, you're not you know, poets, poets are lone beasts. I think generally they tend to like to hang out in a tribe of one. But, um, you know, the, where even if you are, you know, working away alone in your room, you're part of a lineage of um, similar seekers, in a sense, people wanting to understand the meaning of life, the meaning of death, what makes it worthwhile, you know, love, everything. So, um, yeah, I think that that's the linkage. And um, I use the image at the end where the silver koi linked head to tail because that's actually the image on Max Ridfo's book for, uh, for reincarnations. There's this beautiful, it's like the yin yang symbol. Um, so mm. it's like got the two fish, you know, head to tail going around and around. So I think, I think as a lineage of poets who speak um, to each other, that's, um, that's what that refers to. Mm. Well, poetry is often a conversation between poets of different generations as well as between poets of the same generation so that, that, that there is that sense of continuity. Does this poem in a way speak to your own mortality? mortality? Oh yes, definitely, definitely. You know, I'm, I, I, I quite like thinking about death. I don't know why. I don't find it um, scary or distressing. Um, although that's not to say I won't be scared or distressed when my moment comes, um, but I, I, I enjoy um, thinking about it and thinking about um, what happens after death. And yeah, I, that, to me, that's that's um, uh, you know that spiritual worldview is. Um, it's the it's the deepest stuff of life you know actually it, it goes suburban noir you know you might have the the world and its craziness out there and then you've got your own in, internal you know domestic sphere say or personal world but then even deeper down there's another level and when you dive down to that level that's where you do actually find some peace it's like diving under a wave I think you know it's the frothy bits on the top that's Twitter 
<laughs> and then you've got the body of the wave, which is certainly powerful and can bowl you over. And that's all these circumstances, the real stuff you live in your life. But then as we know, no matter how big a wave is, if you dive really down deep, you know, to the, the sand, to the surface of the, the floor of the ocean, it's always it's always still there. So for me, um, I, I ended the book with this poem because as much as the book has a lot of different levels of turbulence you know going on you know it started with that very turbulent poem about this house but this is like in the substrata this is diving under and when you dive deeply into your own mind in that way you can always find a a space of peace um no matter what and I think yeah that's that's what I was trying to express ultimately in this one Mm, well it's a good note to end the book and it's a good note to end our poet's corner thank you so much Michelle, for sharing poems and insights on the theme of suburban noir. Uh, When this video is posted, it will include information on Michelle's books, so please look out for that. Uh, Please check in again at the end of August when Poets Corner will feature the South Australian poet Juan Garrido Salgado uh, on a theme that I don't know yet because I've been so disorganised I haven't been able to get it from him, but I'm sure it'll be interesting. We'll catch you then. Bye. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate speaking to you. You're such a gorgeous um, supporter of poetry in Australia, a gem. And thank you so much to Westwards for having me. Thanks, Michelle.